Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. We want to welcome those that are watching our podcast, vidcast. Give them a big hand clap right now. Come on, Living Word. And also, we want to welcome Scott Sale. What's up, Scott Sale? Watch us on video. And now Living Word Bible Church. And uh, this is... This pastor's been with us. He may have been here more than I, I have. I don't know. He's been with us as long as I can remember. He's, he's family to Living Word Bible Church. And uh, so I'd love it if you get up to your feet to give right now a huge Living Word Bible Church welcome to Pastor Dennis Burke. Come on, Charles. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Glory to God. Come on, shout a praise to the Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hello, Living Word Bible Church, and hello, Scottsdale. Glory to God. Let's hear it, Scottsdale. All right, that was good. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, it's always good. I always look forward to coming to Living Word. It's a, it's, it's a great place, but it's a fun place. And um, I'm, I'm big on having, having a big time, and so I always enjoy coming. I love this ministry and the Anderson family a lot, man. I've watched... Lots of changes over the years, and they've always been good ones, and I appreciate it. And I haven't messed it up. They keep inviting me back, and I appreciate that too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'm glad you're here today, and I believe in the next few minutes that God's going to do something through His Word and by the Holy Spirit that uh, shifts something in your life. You know, every one of us really do need something changing. Amen. Change is still good for me. I've been serving God since 1971, really, been at it. Uh, since then, and uh, I was 17 years old when I gave my life to the Lord, really started to walk it out, so you don't get lost in the math, I'm 64 now, and uh, from 71 until now, I just found out the change is always on God's agenda, God's always looking for something to happen, and uh, looking to do something in me, but I believe today He's looking to do something in every one of us here, that'll make a big difference, man, how many of you still think change is good for you? Is it, is, it's all about change. God doesn't change at all. But we change in the way we receive. We change in the way we're able to see things happen. I want to talk to you about some things I think is going to help that process happen. There's something really powerful about this concept. And that's, this is what I want to really minister to you. How to turn pressure into power. Every one of us deal with pressure Issues, things that come to squeeze us in one way or another. Squeeze your family, peace. Squeeze your health. Squeeze your finances. Squeeze your head. <laughs> squeeze you somehow. So that things uh, don't look like they're turning out or going to ever turn out the way really you'd hope they would or the way God said they could. We've all come under times of pressure. Some of you are in the squeeze right now, the pressure cooker kind of situation. I don't know. Does anybody use a pressure cooker anymore? Is there still pressure... <laughs> All right, well, God bless you. So the microwave has not totally dominated humanity, uh, which I guess is good. But uh, for those of you unaware, there have been pressure cookers. Uh, you cook with pressure, you don't care. But uh, <laughs> I say that because I don't cook with a pressure cooker. <laughs> I'm sorry I brought it up. But, um, but everybody knows what it feels like to be under pressure. And the Bible's full of these kind of stories of people also that were in themselves. They were in pressured times, big pressure. The big names of the Bible, all the big guys. The big names you see throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, both. They all really seem to be people that came under pressure in one way or another. For Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these are the guys. Joseph, he's one of the guys. He came through times of heavy pressure, even though he had a plan from God. Something God gave him, a dream. Two dreams, really. In his case, his brothers, uh, they were part of the problem. How many of you know brothers can be part of the problem? Amen. Okay. Do we have any brothers in the house? I don't know. Are you part of the problem? Anyway. Uh, okay, man, my head just went about five different places. But um, in his case, his own brothers hated him. Not just hated him, but they hated him more once he had some real direction from God. It's amazing. Not every brother, in fact, in Joseph's case, you got a family like his, you don't even need the devil mad at you. 
you know, the brothers will take care of all of it. And they hated him so bad they wanted him dead. They tried to kill him. But it wasn't just his brothers. You know, his brothers did sell him. You know, you got brothers like this. It's amazing. They sold him into slavery. And he was drug across the desert, resold again for a profit, no doubt, to a man named Potiphar in Egypt who loved Joseph uh, because Joseph brought the blessing of God. He didn't let go of the dream even though things weren't going all that well. In fact, things were going terrible. And yet he wouldn't let go of what God gave him. He understood how to handle pressure. And that's really the point I want you to catch. He turned into the guy that actually brought deliverance to all of Israel and actually helped even Egypt and the nations around from famine. I mean, it was amazing what God did because Joseph would not cave into pressure, but he continued to walk it out in the power of God. But all through Scripture, you've got these people, even New Testament, Peter and James and John, and these guys came under heavy pressure. But the Apostle Paul, our hero, man, the guy that wrote the majority of the letters, almost all the letters of the New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he was a guy that came under pressure. But in each of these cases, you read through these narratives, and it almost sounds or looks like they went through these issues with a real ease. They just kind of blew through these things. These were heavy things that were happening, but they, you read it, and it's like they did it so easily. And it just doesn't feel that easy for me, Dennis. I mean, you know, I feel this pressure, and some of us, we're not going through the kind of things that these guys went through even. And yet for us, these are major crises, heavy pressure, real problems, and we feel sort of disconnected because they seem to do it with such ease. I mean, in one case, you remember the story of Paul in the book of Acts. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and when he wrote it, he described the, the ship out in the sea in the storm drifting. I mean, Paul's getting free transportation from the Roman government, but he was chained to the belly of this, of this Roman ship as a prisoner. And uh, they're in a hurricane, man. They're all feeling like they're going to die. And they wash up to shore. And on this little island, the tribes people see Paul and the others thinking that the, the gods were mad at them, but somehow they've been delivered until until a viper locks onto Paul's arm. You've read it. And the tribes people thought that Paul certainly was a criminal. He was a bad dude that the gods now are mad at and wanted him dead, and so he's going to die, and then he doesn't die, and now they think he's a god. People are so funny then and fickle. They change quick. And they look at the circumstances and have a whole new narrative in five minutes. Now he's a god, and it... And yet Paul goes through all of this stuff. And what did he do? This was the thing that just is amazing. He just shook that snake off. You remember the story? He just shook the snake off. And it's like, what kind of man is this? Man, he goes through this stuff. It's crazy. And it's so easy for him. But it's not that easy for me, Dennis. I'm feeling the pressure of my own family or my own limitations or my own financial deal or whatever's going on. And it can seem like we are not the kind of people that these heroes of the Bible really were, and yet all of them dealt with the same kind of nonsense you deal with. And Paul gives us a window to it in the book of 2 Corinthians, and that's where we're going to focus. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul helps us see the thinking, what was going on on the inside, even though he's facing big stuff on the outside, and seemed to do it with such ease. And the reason we're doing this is because we're going to learn some things about how not only Paul turned pressure situations into real power, but how each one of us have access to the exact same thing. We don't have to cave to whatever it is we're going through right now. God's, God's here to release real power into your house, into your body, into your money, into your deal. Whatever's going on, it's time for the power of God to rise up in a bigger way. How many of you think that'd be a good idea for you? Yeah, that ought to be 100% participation. It really should. So open your Bible if you brought it, or we've got an electronic for you for, for those that don't bring their Bible. If you brought your Bible, just lift it high. Come on, I'm going to really put you in pressure. I know. Electronic qualifies. That's okay. Praise God. We, we like electronics until they don't work, you know, <laughs> and we can't stand them. But uh, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians all day. Well, all right, for a few minutes. 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to use the Passion 
translation. Uh, just because smart people write translations and I need all the help I can get. And so you use a translation from smart people and then you sound smart and my goal is to impress you. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, 2 Corinthians, the very first chapter, verse 8. He said, brothers and sisters, you need to know about the severe trials we experienced while we were in Western Turkey. All of the hardships we passed through crushed us beyond measure or beyond our ability to endure. And we were so completely overwhelmed that we were about to give up entirely. Are you kidding me? The Apostle Paul felt like this? Now don't let that sound discouraging, man. It's actually quite encouraging. Because the Apostle Paul did not get crushed. He did not give up. He did not quit. He saw it all the way through, but he had to deal with this kind of feeling just like every one of us have to deal with it. We're not all that different from Paul. Now, he got a lot of amazing results and saw huge miracles, but so can you. We're not all that different from these kind of heroes in the Bible, these big names, but we... We don't feel like we have what it takes. Paul is helping us see we have exactly what it takes. So that's how I want you to hear this. But he goes on and he says in verse 9, it felt like we had a, a death sentence upon our hearts and we still feel that way to this day. A death sentence. He felt like it was the end. He felt like the situations he was in was not going to pan out right. He said it wasn't going to happen right. He said we had a death sentence and a lot of things still speak to us as if it's that way. Now you got to hear this correctly. And all the way through this, when you hear how Paul handles this, this isn't about being defeated. Paul wasn't defeated. But it's about dealing with reality. We're real people, got real problems, just regular folks, but we deal with it through a supernatural infusion from God. And that's where this all goes. Oh, I can't wait to get there, but we've got to read through a couple of things. All right. So he says, we've had this death sentence. And he said, but here's what it taught us. Now, follow this all the way, man. This is so powerful. It taught us to lose faith in ourselves. That almost sounds wrong. Because we encourage our, everybody to have faith in yourself. Don't give up. Don't quit. And it almost sounds like a contradiction until you really follow it all the way through. He said, we... We were taught to lose faith, all faith, in ourselves and to place all of our trust. Say all of our trust. All of our trust, all of our trust in God who, look at this, raises the dead. Even when we have a death sentence in ourselves, it ain't over. We believe in a God that raises the dead. And when you're up against the wall, that doesn't mean this is the end, man. When you get the report that says there's no way out, that isn't the end. We believe a God, in a God of resurrection power. Things are not over just because it looks like it's over. Glory to God. This isn't just hype, man. This is real power. This is how it happens. So he says in verse 10, he has rescued us from terrifying encounters with death. Now, you drop down to chapter 4 and you start to get some details about how Paul really handled these moments. Because it's not just knowing that God wants to do stuff. It's discovering what really connects us so that we're having the experiences. It's, oh, I like that, the roses. That was good, actually. I like roses. The, the, the smell is not the same as the taste. You, you don't fill up on the smell. A victory. You got to taste it. It's not enough just to know God wants it. It's finding out how to really absorb it and take it in and activate these things so something's really happening. We've got a lot of people that try to believe the right things, but nothing's happening because they haven't really connected with what causes things to happen. Things don't happen in our life only because God wants it to happen. God having a plan and a design and a desire for us does not mean things happen that he wants and plans and desires. You know, God's will is that everybody get born again, but not everybody is. Why is that? Not because God doesn't want it. He wants it for everybody. But people have to react, respond, receive, absorb what God's said and done and make it personal, man. Something's got to happen from the inside of every person. That's, that's God's gift to us of 
the right to make choices. The right to choose is what makes us most like God. That we can choose His way or refuse His way, but either way, we've made a choice and God gives us that right. That's what His love has offered to us. Free choice. But you got to choose His way to activate His results. All right, you get it. Now, 2 Corinthians, we're still in that same book, chapter 4, though. The first verse says, Now, it's because of God's mercy that we have been entrusted with the privilege. Everybody say privilege. The privilege of this new covenant ministry. And we will not quit or faint with weariness. Everybody say it out loud. I will not quit either. No, we're not quitting or fainting. But here's the game that Satan tries to use on all of us. The weariness to wear you out. To just give you enough reasons to question your confident place in God and what God's offered. To give you enough weight to try to weigh you down and keep you off balance and feeling like it's not really happening even though, gosh, you know, they tell us this at church all the time that we're to be healed and delivered and helped and blah, 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 and it just isn't happening. And I, I'm not sure I have what it takes for people like other people receive. Now, that's the strategy. I know we get past this, but you've got to deal with it. It doesn't happen automatically. Victory doesn't come automatically. All the tools for it comes automatically. All the promise for it comes automatically. All of the possibility comes, but it doesn't happen automatically. We just have to engage. So he tells us how this goes. Drop down to verse 6. He gives us a lot of light now. We're going to really get into it here. So I'm about to get to my message. All right, there really wasn't any enthusiasm over me getting to my message, but I'm just going to go ahead and take it like you're mesmerized with the depth of what's going on here. Keep pressing forward. For God who said, we're, we're in verse 6. Here's the quote from the Old Testament, book of Genesis. Let light or brilliant light shine out of darkness. That was God's word at creation, wasn't it? Light be, and light was. That's how it all started, but... Paul says it this way. He says, the same God who said that is the one who has cascaded his light into us. The brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of God. I love this stuff. As we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ, he has put the light of knowledge not the knowledge you get at the universities or what have you, the light of the knowledge of who God is and who you are now that you're in Christ. That's on the inside of us. And now watch how he really goes into it. Verse 7, he said, we are like common clay jars. And we feel that a lot of times. We're just common. We're just clay jars. Mud pots, maybe. That might be another way. To, <laughs> that was rough. But... Uh, we feel like, let's go with common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure. Ooh, I love this. So that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen, but seen as God's power and not ours. God wants His power in our life to be seen. He wants there to be evidence that God is really working and He's really in your life. You know, we need happier Christians. We need Christians that really have the sense that God actually is within and there really are victories and there is hope ahead and there is a reason for joy. We need Christians that stay locked in on this even though there's a lot of trash that goes on. We've discovered the right and the reason that we have to rejoice in Christ. It's because... He really has overcome, and he's given us the tools and the, and the ability to walk in that overcoming power. He said, we're just common. We're common folks. We're just regular people with real problems, real issues. But he said, we carry something. He calls it a treasure. I love this, man. The treasure is inside of, some trans, translations say, earthen vessels. We're just regular folks, but we carry an extraordinary power. And you cannot and must not forget that. If you're going to walk in this, you have to stay locked in on the reality that you really carry a treasure on the inside of you, that God has entrusted himself and what he has done to your innermost being. He's deposited and infused on the inside of you 
the capacity to rise up and overwhelm and overcome any enemy or strategy that comes at you. This is spiritual power. No, we're not looking to dominate people. We're not calling people the enemy, even though sometimes they feel like it. <laughs> All right, sometimes they act like it. All right, sometimes it's really hard to distinguish the difference. <laughs> but they're not really the enemy. There is an enemy, though, who has come to find a way to derail you and undermine your confidence and faith in God. Man, he's, he works to wear you out. But we have extraordinary overflow of power on the inside of us. You may not feel like a powerhouse, but the treasure's in there. You may have left the treasure chest closed and not really accessed it all that much, but it's all there ready for you to dip in, stir up. And he gives us some light, even further light on this. Verse 8, he said, though we experience every kind of pressure, say it out loud, every kind of pressure. Sometimes we can handle, we feel like, one kind of pressure coming one way. But this is pressure that may come from a lot of different angles and places and strategies. Every kind. Paul said, we've had every kind of pressure, but we're not crushed. Amen. Now, I know what some people think. Well, you know, Dennis, pressure is not all bad. You know, from pressure, we get diamonds. Diamonds come from pressure. You've got to hang out a long time for that. But <laughs> pressure comes... I mean, diamonds come from pressure. Yeah, but other things come from pressure. You see, dumb decisions come from pressure. Amen. Timeshares come from pressure. <laughs> There's various other things that come from pressure. So we have to determine how we're handling pressure and not crushed or caving in. That's how it feels sometimes. You caved in. Especially when you walk away and start getting those bills every month. Uh, so pressure is not really designed. It's not there to do you good. It's there to do something else, really. But Paul says this, we've had every kind of pressure, but we're not crushed. Say it out loud, I'm not crushed either. Not crushed. He said at times we don't know what to do. But quitting is just not an option. We got to get this. We got to be like this. We got to let this attitude and this mindset really become our own. We're not denying that pressure comes. We're not playing a game saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. Because <laughs> not everything always is fine. A lot of times, man, there's some real trash going on. It doesn't just go away, but you learn how to equalize and neutralize pressure and realize that you are not going to quit even when you don't know exactly what to do. We don't always have the exact answer right at the moment. But what I know is what not to do. I'm not quitting on this. I'm not done. It's not over. I believe in resurrection power, that it's on the inside of me. And I'm igniting it and stirring it up within my own life. Glory to God. He said, again in verse 9 now, he says, We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We're not alone. You know, sometimes family can turn on you. Not everybody in your family maybe is all that excited about what you know now about Jesus. Sometimes you can feel like a failure because your family is not really responding all that well to you. Well, you know, it's just not all about you. <laughs> oh, did I just... Pop a bubble. Man, I felt like one of them burst. But uh, if it is, if it's not about you. And so really, it's really not about you trying to make sure your family turns out just right in every instance and believes everything exactly right. Somewhere along the line, we do have to believe God wants this for our families even more than we do. Amen. But then he says it this way, <clears throat> still in verse 9. He said, we may be knocked down, but we're not knocked out. I love that line. Knocked down. This is Paul. He said, even, even him. He may have been knocked down. I don't know. There's a weird kind of twisted comfort in knowing that Paul felt pressure, felt persecuted, was knocked down, and didn't always know exactly what to do. I don't know. I'm, it, it does, is that like misery loves company? I, we don't want that, but... But here's how he handled it. Here's how he dealt with it. Here's the mindset that it takes. He said, we're not crushed. We're not quitting. 
we're not forsaken, and we're not out. And that's what really has to emerge out of every one of us. This isn't just positive thinking. This is real believing. But here's in verse 13, he gives us part of the key to why this really works. In verse 13, he says, we have the same spirit of faith that is described in Scripture when it says, first we believed, then I spoke in faith. And then he goes on and says, so we also first believe, then we speak in faith. What you believe matters. What you say releases power. What you believe counts. We have to believe right. Right believing is mandatory, really. Doesn't mean we know everything to believe just right. We, we grow, we change, we modify, we increase. But what's vital is that we put what we believe in our own lips. I not only believe God wants me well, I declare I am the healed. I not only believe that God has, has promised to prosper my life, I declare I prosper in everything I set my hands to do. And I don't just say it in church or when somebody leads me in it or when Pastor Scott or Holly began to give me things to say. I'm saying it all the time. In casual conversation, I mean, even if the TV, and every so often the TV talks to me because, of the, you know, I turned it on. <laughs> you don't like what the TV says, you know, just don't watch it. But, uh, but even when it says, you know, flu season has come or white shoe season has passed. <laughs> even when it says, got a few more days. I mean, even I knew of Labor Day, you know. <laughs> All right, I got to wait till the last service to really get off into that. But, um, because he's got another stab at me here. Uh, but we're rule breakers around here. We're not, we're not governed by the calendar. We're governed by something else. Anyway, we'll work on that. But I think you got it already. Okay, sorry I brought that up. But in spite of all of the various strategies that come at us, the way Satan tries to corral us, and tries to squeeze us, we've found how to equalize and even neutralize this pressure. And we use our words. We even say it when we're by ourselves. Man, I say these things. If I'm driving in the car, the TV talks to me, says flu season has come. I talk back. Doesn't come to my house. I mean, some people, they prepare and plan for it, man. They buy new pajamas. They go out and fill their cabinet, cabinet with all kinds of medicines and stuff, get their prescription renewed and all this kind of stuff because the flu season coming. Man, we're going to be spending some time in bed. <laughs> they just plan for it. They expect it. Not me, not my house. And I just go ahead and declare it. Amen? All right. So we believe and then we speak. Listen, there is a... Something real important, and, and I learned this in, in snorkel diving. I grew up in Southern California, and I liked water stuff, and I'd, I'd snorkel dive and chase fish and shoot them, and, uh, <laughs> which I felt was a lot more fair than deceiving them into biting into a hook and then yanking them out of their environment. You know, I just felt like chasing them gave them more of a, at least honest, fair chance. <laughs> All right, I never really thought about that, but it just seemed to fit. So, uh, but I learned this, and you learn it even swimming in a deep, deep end of the pool, man. You learn that uh, the water pressure can really limit how deep you're going to end up going. You get down 8, 10 feet, man, and you're done, man. I mean, the pressure is more than you're going to be able to endure and take for much longer. You're sure not going to go much deeper because the water pressure presses on your ears, and it's painful. But you can learn how to... Equalize the pressure. It's not hard. You just pinch your nose and blow. And boom, man, your ears pop. And uh, then what? You get to go deeper. It's not all that hard. You learn how to create more pressure from the inside than what's coming at you from the outside. And then it's as if there's no pressure at all. We live our life not free from pressure, but we live our life 
able to equalize and neutralize its ability to impact our life, our thinking, or our future. We're not going to be moved by these events and this pressure that tries to come at us because we've discovered the key. We figured out how to live in this world, not free from pressure, but free from the effects of allowing it to change our life or determine our future. Because we learned how this deposit inside of us doesn't have to come fresh out of heaven. It's already been born into us by the new birth and by this infusion of the Holy Spirit within. And when we decide to not allow God to any longer have to lie dormant within our life, but we access this pressure and release something within, it neutralizes this pressure on the outside and it feels as if there's no pressure whatsoever. It's amazing how this works. Paul gives us even further insight in chapter 12. Let's drop down to chapter 12. I want to be sure you get this because this is finally going to be my text for this message today. And so it's going to be a very short message. But in chapter 12, he says it this way. In verse 7, he says, The extraordinary level of revelations I've received is no reason for anyone to exalt me. For this is why a thorn in my flesh was given to me. Say given. Given. See, a lot of people have had the weird idea that God gave Paul something to keep him humble because he had so many revelations. But wait, 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 wait. God's the one that gave him the revelations. Surely he knows what revelation does to a person. It's not about him puffing up. It's about him growing up in the things God showed him so there was given to him something, but it didn't come by God. There was a thorn, he said, a thorn in the flesh given to him. But he says right here how it came. He said it was the adversary's messenger who sent it to harass me. He was sent to harass Paul. Who sent this messenger? He said it right there. Come on, this is open book. Uh, (laughs) Messenger of who? Who? The adversary. All right. We got it. It came from the adversary, and he came to threaten these revelations that Paul had received just like it comes at us in one way or another. Satan has given a messenger to harass you too. And comes at you in different forms and fashions and different ways. Messenger of the enemy that has come to unravel revelation that God has given you already of the goodness of God and the love he has for you and the promise that he's made of various things. Those ideas come by the Spirit of God, but a messenger of Satan comes to dumb it down and to change it so that you won't walk in it. Paul called it a thorn in the flesh. Whatever that was, and he doesn't tell us anything more than this, it was a messenger of the devil. There's a real war going on, and it's a war against your success and victory. That's why when you come here, I love this place. And and Pastor Scott even said, man, this is a place committed to bringing you into a greater place of success, of joy, of laughter, of what life was designed for. But there's an enemy to all of this. And he's going to look for what will squeeze you, pressure you, maybe the way somebody talked or didn't talk or said something or didn't say something or they didn't shake my hand or they didn't look at me just right. Did you see what they did to me? And whatever it is that flips your switch and ticks you off. Can you say that in church? Is that all right? Ticks you, ticks you off. <laughs> you know, like too late. <laughs> but uh, whatever it is, whatever's come to harass you, Whatever flips your switch, if Satan finds a way to squeeze you, it begins to crush and squeeze the real life and joy out of you. But God's given you a substance, a treasure. So watch how this goes. Paul said this. In verse 8, he said, Three times I played with the Lord to relieve me of this. This is Paul praying this prayer. God, get this off of me. Isn't that what we want? We want God to do it. But look at what God said. He didn't say he was going to get it off of Paul. He said, my grace is more than enough for you. Now, here's what that does not mean. It does not mean that God said, no, Paul, you're going to have to live with this the rest of your life. And you're just going to have to grow up to understand that this is the cross you have to bear. Whatever it is, whatever that thorn was all about, whatever the devil had done, 
is just something you're just going to have to have and live with the rest of your life. No, that wasn't the message at all. He said, my grace is enough for you, more than enough, and finds its full expression in your weakness. You don't have to feel condemned because of weakness. You and I get to understand that weakness becomes the place of power. And here it is. Watch this. At the end of verse 10, well, I'll read all of verse 10. He said, so I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. Drop down to the last line of verse 10. This is so powerful. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Glory to God. My weakness is no longer what brings me down. It becomes the place for power. So I don't have to live with this weakness one moment longer. I identify that even though I feel like I haven't had what it takes, I've locked into a God who is more than enough to deal with whatever comes at me, and my weakness has today become a place for power. We can delight in what has tried to defeat us, not because we live with it any longer, but because it becomes a place for power. We live in the power because we dig into it. We release the treasure. We believe it, but then we declare it. And I want you to stand with me right now, and we're going to declare this together. Glory to God. Weakness is not going to derail us, defeat us, discourage us. Nope, nope, nope. We're believers around here. Say it out loud. I'm a believer. And I declare that even this weakness, the threat, the discouragement that tried to come, the bad report that seemed like death sentence on me, I'm not defeated by it. I'm delighted in this moment because I've become a portal of power. I receive that power. The treasure is in me, floods through me, and drives every bit of that weakness out. I'm a conqueror because I've locked into Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Come on, shout a praise to Jesus. It's all about his power born inside of your life. Glory to God. We don't trust ourselves, but we do trust him. And he's given us more than enough of his grace to deal with all this trash. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Come on, shout a praise to the Lord again. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Are you glad you came today? Yeah. Man, you're in the zone right now. This is the place that things shift and change. This is when life takes on a whole new place. I mean, I don't care how it was as you walked in the door. I mean, I do care, but I don't care. You know, I mean, I care. Okay, I care. Uh, you know, uh, but I don't care. And how it was when you walked in, because we're walking out different. We've tapped a treasure. Came because of Jesus Christ. We're not trusting our own ability here now. We're tied in to that deposit within. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now, in just a moment, Pastor Scott's going to come. They've got a few things they got to do. Also, before things wrap up, I want to remind you, though, before I'm done, I brought materials that are out on the table. I really want you to get a hold of this, and I'm so excited to tell you that Vicki's great book on, called Some Days You Dance is now also an MP3 audio book, and it's available to download. We've got a few left on the table. The early services were quite greedy, so they were not thinking of you. But there are a few left. It's also downloadable, or we'll be happy to send, send it to you if you'd like it that way. But uh, Some Days You Dance, it is... It is really such a powerful testimony, but teaching of how Vicki dealt with having hit the wall herself a number of years ago now, but real issues, real trouble. She'd served God, walked in Christ, walked in ministry, married to me for a lot of years, and certainly I know I contributed to her hitting the wall, you know, which is what guys do. But, uh, but she discovered from God some things that she dug into that grace and the power of the word that just exploded things in her life in a brand new way. 
and it's just one of the most powerful things we've ever produced. And so the book's available, but also now the MP3 audio book, and we're just excited that's available for you. Lots of other things. You still glad you came today? Yeah. Come on, shout another praise to the Lord. Amen. God bless you, Living Word. God, God bless you, Scottsdale. Thank you, Pastor. I'm so glad that you're still watching. We're going to continue this on our Wake Up Show. It's a daily Bible study, Monday through Friday. You can go to YouTube and just search Daily Bible Study. You can find us. And what we do is we take what he teaches, what I teach, and we just go a little, we go farther with it. We it's do. a whole lot of fun. You can go to wakeuptv.tv. And also there you could donate. You could give if you, if you receive something today. We just encourage you to, to be give, a giver. Yeah, be a giver and sow back into what the Lord has poured into your life. Make sure you always give to your local church, yeah. but yeah. your offering, you can give so that it allows us to take this message even further. We got your super awesome, amazing Discovering Your Identity book. Incredible. It's on Amazon. It's Yeah. And, and this is really about the confusion that's out there about people's purpose, about what they're supposed to be doing, direction, plans in their life, and really about who they are. Right. And so this is... It, it clears it up using scripture about who you are in Christ. So discovering your authentic identity, and you can search for this on Amazon. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity right now. It's very simple. It's very easy. Say this prayer with me and believe it in your heart and you have it. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't earn it. You can't somehow be good enough to do it. And so I know oftentimes the enemy wants to make you feel like, well, I'm not a good person or you don't know what I've done. But Jesus died for every one of your sins. Not some, but all. And I know that we all are still going to mess up, so don't even let that worry you. All that today is about is securing your eternity with a prayer. Say this prayer with us and believe it and you're saved. Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for forgiving me of all of my sins. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You're in. You're in. God bless you. Uh, we just thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.